Christian Living 101 presents a Bible class on the fundamental basics of victorious Christian living. Establish a strong foundation for conquering the trials and temptations of daily life. Increase your faith and learn to use the powerful weapons of spiritual warfare as you study with Pastor Gene Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. Greetings, everyone. We come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Redeemer. What a privilege it is to join with you today in our study on Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. You'll recall our subject last week was entitled God's Second Covenant with Israel. Uh, we covered uh, chapter number 29 in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, verses 1 through 9. Now let's begin reading in chapter 29 of Deuteronomy, verse number 8, we'll start with. And it says, And we took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half of the tribe of the Manassites. So keep the words of this covenant to do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. Now you'll recall that uh, Moses had spoken to the men of Israel had gotten them all together 
uh, I said that it probably would be a good uh, convention uh, uh, attitude or gathering that uh, came about because all the men came together in one place. And uh, uh, Moses said, I brought you together because the Lord has something that he wants to give to you and he wants all of you to hear it straightforward right from, as it were, the mouth of God. Now we know that God was using Moses to present this covenant, but there are times when uh, God speaks through Moses uh, in the first person. And that's what we're dealing with here in this uh, part of the chapter. We're going to be discussing the fact that God now has told them that you need to remember what he's done for you. You need to remember how you've seen everything going on and what uh, victories we have brought forth uh, at the hand of God as we traveled through all of the nations that were in the road between Egypt and where we are today. And so begin with me now in verse number 10 as we start studying Deuteronomy 29. It says, you stand today, Moses is speaking in behalf of Almighty God, you stand today, all of you, before the Lord your God, your chiefs, your tribes, your elders, and your officers, even all the men of Israel. How did they keep that organized? How did they keep things moving as they needed to move? And of course we know that they went from place to place, pitched camp, uh, and would be there for a little season, and then they would move on. Well, this tells us how organized they really were. As we stop and think about this, it says uh, he's talking to the chiefs, he's talking to the tribes themselves as a congregational situation. He's talking about the elders, the spiritual leaders uh, of the house of Israel, and your officers, that was the legal enforcers of those uh, that were in the house of Israel and in the, in the uh, desert place there. And then in verse 11 he goes on and he speaks uh, even about the family situation when he says, your little ones, your wives, and the alien which is within your camps, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water. Now this gives us a little insight about uh, what uh, was going on in the, in the general uh, congregational uh, gathering of the Israelites in the wilderness uh, because it speaks specifically to different groups of people within the uh, household of Israel itself. And the thing that I want to show you today I think that is very important God did not leave out the family situation. He didn't leave out the wives. He didn't leave out the children. Now, let's face it. Uh, we do have some ideas and attitudes today uh, that uh, some of us have heard taught uh, that, you know, the wives and the kids don't mean very much. It's all the man uh, that uh, is to receive the word of God, and then he uh, is responsible for his household and certainly uh, there's truth to that, but it does not exclude the children and the wives. And he makes it very plain in this covenant situation that God is speaking to the men because they are the head of the household and they are responsible for uh, the gathering and the functioning of the tribe itself and, and then the congregant of the uh, 12 tribes that are all together there in the nation of Israel as they travel through the desert. And it's a very interesting situation. He does not stop with just the Israelites. Now, many of us have had a little bit of a problem with some teachings that have taught us that, uh, well, you know, there's no place for the alien in the kingdom of God. Well, some say, well, now that changed in the New Testament when um, uh, Jesus died for everybody and, and he came to save the whole world. God in the Old Testament recognized the aliens that were within the camp of Israel 
chose to serve them and chose to serve their God as they uh, walked through the land from Egypt to the promised land that God had told them would be theirs. Now, you can decipher this any way you want to. You cannot get out of the idea here that uh, God spoke even to the aliens and, and commanded them that he was making this covenant with them who served the house of Israel. Now another thing we might point out, and, and that is that uh, the Israelites did have servants. They had those that, uh, whether they had purchased their services or whether they'd voluntarily come and joined Israel and uh, uh, had voluntarily served as uh, their housekeepers and their uh, water bearers and their uh, providers as they traveled through the land. We don't know exactly all of the details, but we do know God did not exclude them when he's giving the second covenant unto the children of Israel in the wilderness to serve them as they traveled through the land. And they chose to follow Israel's God and Israel's people. God did not exclude them. He included them in the covenant that he was making with them. Now let's hear what the covenant is. Verse 13 says, In order that he may establish you today as his people, and that he may be your God, just as he spoke to you, and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And again we go back. Everything is based upon the covenant that God gave unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's no escaping that. But these next two covenants, the first that uh, was made with Israel at Horeb, uh, and the second now that's being made with Israel at this point, we find that we have to realize that these are additional covenants that God is continuing to make with the household of Israel as they are getting prepared in not too far distant future uh, to go into the promised land and to take it over. And so he said that he did all of this in order that he may establish you today as his people and that he may be your God. Now you notice here that he has included the alien as being part of or receiving the fullness of the covenant of God that he is giving to his chosen people, Israel themselves. Now, verse 14, Now not with you alone am I making this covenant and this oath. Oh! This is not just for them. This is for those that come in their future. For he says, uh, but both with those who stand here with us this day in the presence of the Lord, our God, with those who are not with us here today. Now, we need to understand that there are going to be some descendants. They weren't with them there today. And there may have been some who was not gathered together with them that day. I do not know. I do know that God said that he wanted all the men to be there and that he was going to speak to all the men. And of course the men then would go back and they would tell uh, what God had declared in covenant form to them the promises that God had made, and the conditions that, that Israel was going to have to live in if they received the benefit of the covenant of Almighty God that he was making with them this day in the wilderness. Praise the Lord. Now isn't it wonderful how God made it so plain? As we read in verse 14 and 15, I'm not making this covenant with you alone, but I'm making it with you uh, and those who are not here today. Uh, this covenant is still in force today, beloved. It's still in force today as God's covenant with his own people. And you say, oh, well, Jesus came. Yes, Jesus came 
But what did he come to do? He came to fulfill, not to destroy. He came to fulfill, not to do away. And so, we find now that you and I can walk in the strength and the ability of our Lord in living up to the requirements of the covenant that God's making and the covenants that He's made after this from time to time through the prophetic word of the great prophets of the Old Testament. And you know most of us don't think of Moses as being a prophet. Uh, probably he's one of the greatest prophets that uh, ever walked on the face of the earth because uh, he is the one who spoke unto Israel and led them step by step by step uh, as God directed him uh, even to the point uh, that we find as we go back through the history of their travels in the desert uh, that there were many complaints, there were many rebellions, there were many uh, attitudes that had to be dealt with and corrected. And sometimes uh, God spoke very strongly and very uh, powerfully, I guess would be the word I'm looking for, uh, to the house of Israel in dealing with those who dared to come against him, uh, Moses their leader, because really they were coming against the directives and, and the authority of God Almighty. And there's a little uh, thing here that I want to just put in uh, to mention. God has down through the ages uh, had men that he set apart uh, to represent him spiritually unto the congregant uh, of peoples that uh, are ministered to from the word of God. And you need to remember that when you're tearing one of the leaders apart uh, that God has given unto you and you're critical of everything they do and you're in a situation where uh, you just uh, can't hardly abide what's being directed to you from the word, uh, you need to remember that you must be careful uh, if that, uh, uh, that man that is being led of the Lord or is in the position of leading others in scriptural and spiritual uh, uh, teaching and directives, uh, uh, you need to be sure that you're not coming against God. Now, I want to make something very plain here. There are a lot of men down through the ages that have put on uh, the cloak of the clergy, shall we say, and have acted as the Pharisees did in the Old Testament, uh, where uh, uh, they decided that God needed some more laws and some more directives uh, uh, than what he was giving the people. And so they decided to put their own touch on things, uh, and they made rules and regulations and corrupted the word of God, and all kinds of things happened down through the ages by uh, men who claimed to be anointed of God and directed of God, and uh, who claimed to be leading according to the word of the Holy Spirit and the word of the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, being the word itself. Uh, and uh, and uh, they would come to a place where uh, they passed themselves off uh, as the authority spiritually over whomever they made contact with and and whomever would come and submit themselves unto their leadership and teaching. Now, we know that Satan has his uh, counterfeits planted all throughout the, the kingdom of God uh, that has been established down through the ages. And we know that uh, even in Jesus' day, he made it very, very plain that those who claim to be so spiritual and so holy and so powerful in authority actually were the servants of, of the devil when he spoke to the Pharisees and said, You're of the father, the devil. You are, your, you are of your father, the devil. And, uh, and so let me say this. Yes, if you know that a man that has 
possessed of the possession of leadership in the eyes of people and continues to go forth in the name of the Lord and is not teaching the ways of the Lord, is not living the ways of the Lord, yes, you have a right to, and you have a responsibility to say, hey, wait a minute. That's not in the Word. That's not what God said. That's not of the Lord. We're not going to abide by what you're teaching any longer. And you do have that responsibility, and we do have that responsibility. And, and those of us who are teaching the Word to the very best of our ability uh, in, in purity and, and directive of the Holy Spirit also have a responsibility to go to that person and say, Hey, you are not teaching the Word of God, and if you are not teaching the Word of God, you're not part of us, and we need to make it known that there is a place that we must abide in absolute obedience and submission to the work of the Holy Spirit as he divides the message of God, the Word of God, the knowledge of our Lord and Jesus Christ, the, the Redeemer of our souls, and uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, we have a responsibility to see to it that the Kingdom of God is not adulterated with the false prophets that really they're everywhere today. And the sad part of it is that many of the churches who claim that they are uh, born-again, dedicated people of God, and I know some of them are. Don't misunderstand me. I know that some of them are. But we need to also know uh, that there are many who have been blinded, and they are following blindly the edicts, the ordinances, the directives uh, uh, that are given unto them by men, and not through the Word of God, or by the Word of God, or by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so you see, beloved, it's a situation where God is pointing out uh, uh, that He wants to speak directly to those that are submitted unto Him, not just unto men. And so he had all the officers there, he had all of the elders there, he had all of the city councilmen there, he had all the governors there, uh, speaking in today's language. And uh, uh, he was giving forth what he wanted them all to know, straight from him, as Moses spoke and gave unto the people this second covenant. Now I want to uh, take you from verse 15 now into verse 16. And it says, For you know how we lived in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. And again, he's calling to attention that they cannot deny the word of God because God has proven his word and has proven his faithfulness and has proven his uh, determination that he will not um, in any measure uh, cause Israel to be misled. He will guide and direct and by his spirit and through, in this case, uh, Moses their leader at this time. And uh, so he says uh, in, uh, in verse 16, you know how we live. I, I read that. And so as he says in verse 16, you know how we came through these nations. You know how we got through the wilderness from uh, Egypt to the point where we are now. And uh, as near as I can tell, they were very, very close to the land of Israel that they were about ready to go in and, and take uh, uh, from the heathen nations that uh, uh, had lived there and ruled there and abided there for probably centuries. And so uh, we see him saying that uh, both those who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God and with those who are not here with us today, uh, you all know where we've been. And I think I spoke enough to that last week as I stressed the fact that even today as born-again believers in the kingdom of God through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to understand that we have a responsibility and a living covenant, a living covenant 
of Almighty God that he made with us, and he has proven his ability to live up and to exercise his part of that covenant by the examples that he has given as Israel came through the desert place, all the trials and the tribulations that they went through, and now here they are. And so we go on, and we look at verse 17. It says, Moreover, you have seen their abominations and their idols of wood, stone, silver, gold, which they had with them. Oh! Now, we look at this picture and we begin to see that there's far more being undertaken here by God to educate and to teach the children of Israel uh, who they were and what the requirements of their life was to be as they were to abide within the covenants that God had given unto them. And he makes it very plain. You have seen the miracles that I perform. You've seen the power uh, that I have given unto you and your leadership. You've seen my ability to save, protect, and keep, uh, provide. And so now I want you to take note and remind you, you've also seen the other side of the coin. Now we have to remember that even in these New Testament ages, after Christ came and was crucified on the cross, died, rose again, and uh, overcame death, hell, gra the grave, and, and all of that, we need to remember that uh, our flesh is still carnal. And uh, although spiritually within we have become new creatures, uh, we have been given a power and an ability by Almighty God uh, to bring the flesh into control. And, and I've had some people question and sort of lift an eyebrow at this next statement that I, I make because I've made it before. And, and I tell them and I tell you that when you became born again, uh, your spirit was cleansed and purified and every sin you ever committed, the sin of your carnal flesh, your mind, your thought, whatever uh, kind of sin you may have, been involved with and even the sinful nature with which you were born into because of Adam's sin, all of that was changed from within when God cleansed you and gave you new life in Jesus Christ our Lord and our Redeemer. Now as a result of that, the statement that I make is, for the first time in your life, once you became a born-again believer, from that time on, you have the power, the authority, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit to inform and reveal unto you right and wrong. You have it all within you, and you have the power and the authority in the name of Jesus Christ to, to rebuke the devil, to rebuke those who are false leaders, to rebuke those who are rebellious in the kingdom of God, to take authority over them, and to see to it that the word of God is brought forth pure, clean, unperverted, and easily to understand in a way that even the children can know the way of the Lord and abide therein as they are tutored by their parents and by their spiritual leaders. It's a, it's a beautiful thing that God has done. And so now all this time he's been preparing them. Well, in order to prepare them, we see two sides of the coin. We see the righteousness of God. We see the power of God, the authority of God, the provision ability of God on one side. And then on the other side of the coin, we have uh, the evil works of the enemy. We have the heathen nations and their idol gods that they bow and worship. Uh, having made images of those gods, uh, they bow before them uh, and they have become idols in in their land and, and then we've been able to see the social lifestyle which they live and as we came through the desert place we get to see the other side of the coin and God says here in verse 17 moreover you've seen their abominations 
You have seen how they sin. You have seen how abominable they are. You have seen how without conscience and moral value they are. You have seen how they worship the idol gods of, of uh, Satan's kingdom instead of Almighty God, their Creator. You have seen how the devil has prospered them, and you've seen their silver and their gold and, and all of the things that they have gathered together as they've served the heathen gods of this world. And uh, you look at that and you say, well, then I guess it's wrong. It must be wrong for Christians to have any gold or silver. Oh no, it's not wrong at all. It's a matter of how you get it, what you get, where you get, and what the motive of using it is as you have it. And you say, well now, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, if you'll remember when the children of Israel left Egypt, they came and piled upon them their silver, their gold, and their jewels. And they gave it unto them and said, get, 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 go, go. We want you out of here. If you don't get out of here, we're going to all be destroyed. And they willingly gave their valuable possessions to the children of Israel. Now, if there had been something wrong with possessing those things, do you really think God would have allowed Israel to receive them? Do you really think that God would have taken that which the heathen had gathered together unto themselves and give it, by the way, he tells us that he's going to give us the, the value and the and the precious things of this world that are now presently ruled over by the Babylonian system in which we live. It'll be ours someday. No, there's nothing wrong with having it. The thing that's wrong is do you covet it? Is it something that you worship? Is it something you measure your spirituality with? Well, I'm spiritual, I'm holy, I'm righteous. Because look what God has allowed me to prosper in? I don't think so. I think that what the deal is here is that God is showing the corrupt, infectious, cancer-like work of greed and jealousy, yes. Where there's greed, there's always jealousy. And of clamoring after possession instead of after the purity and the wonderful and marvelous relationship that we have in Jesus Christ and unto our Heavenly Father. And so he's saying, you've seen their abominations and their idols of wood, and you're smart enough to know that their idols of wood and so forth can't do very much for them. But we need to remember something, folks. Their idols of, of wood and stone, and silver, and gold were symbols that represented spiritual powers of darkness. Now I'm going to tell it again. There are many gods in this world today. There were many gods in the world back in Israel's day when they were being delivered from the bondage of Egypt. And we need to understand that the symbolisms that the heathen nations put together to represent those gods was an abomination before the Lord and before Almighty God our Heavenly Father. Today we have the same situation. You know, you need to be careful, and I don't want to be critical here of any individual person or situation. But you need to be careful when you hear people say, well, now I'm a believer. Well, Satan's a believer. You'll never have any, any fulfillment through any of the works of Satan, and you need to know that having seen both sides, the delivering power of Almighty God and the destructive power and the false uh, activity and uh, hope, uh, false hope 
that the heathens have, and you need to weigh the two. And he said, now, you've come through and you've seen the power of God. You've come through and you've seen the heathen nations and how they live and what their societal standards are and, and how they uh, determine to live their life and who they really serve and uh, who is the strongest. God brought us through those places and here we are today. They have no power is what he was saying to Israel. And you and I need to come to the place when we uh, begin to uh, grow in the Lord and begin to really be aware of the fact that, uh, hey, I'm born again. My sins have been forgiven. God has cast them away into the sea of his forgetfulness. Not to be remembered against us anymore. And anyone who has accepted the the birthright of, into the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Redeemer, need to understand that uh, we walk in new authority, new power, new ability, and the powers of destruction round about us may take their toll on our flesh. But in great measure, God preserves us and keeps us uh, and provides for us, uh, and we come out victorious uh, as we conclude the situation in our daily walk as we enter into eternity. It's really something beautiful. And so, in verse 18 he says, the reason that you have come through this and you've seen the societal lifestyle of the heathens, the reason is, lest there shall be among you a man or a woman. Oh, now here he's including a woman in this covenant, remember? Or family. Oh, he's including the children. Or, let's look at something else here, real careful, but I don't miss anything. Um, what else was there? Oh! Or a tribe, that means a, a group of people whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations, lest there shall be among you a root-bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood. Now, you've heard me and I suppose a thousand other people say, you know, one bad apple spoils the whole bushel. When one of them spoils, if it's not removed from the rest, it won't be long until that corruption passes on to each, and eventually, within a short period of time, the whole thing is spoiled. Now, one of the great problems we have today, we do not have people in leadership who have the courage to say unto the abominable, the ungodly, the immoral, uh, those who serve the gods of this world, uh, that you have no place in our fellowship, no place in our kingdom uh, of God, if your determination is that you're going to pretend to serve God, but continue serving the gods of this world. And God refers to it as Moses is speaking here. Uh, the reason that you came through these lands, and I, I showed you how my power and my ability would lead you through and protect you and bring you out victoriously, was so that you could see I'm more powerful than what the gods of the heathen nations are. And so he says, I've done this so that uh, if there be any man, woman, tribe, whatever, that is determined to continue in their ungodly, unwholesome ways, no life change, no lifestyle change at all, uh, just claiming to be a child of God, saved and born again, uh, if they don't live like that, and they become a seed that is poisonous. And in your midst, as they are there, they will one by one, sometimes in multiples, they will cause the purity 
of my people to be defiled because they will persuade them that you don't have to be that particular about how you live. You don't really have to change your way. I mean, after all, uh, you did uh, you did know that Jesus uh, was born of a virgin. Oh, yes, I know that. Uh, well, you do know that he died and was crucified on the cross. Oh, yes, yes, I believe. I'm sure of that. Uh, well, then you do know that he was resurrected from the from the dead. Yes. Oh, yeah, I have no doubt of that. Well, uh, then uh, that's all you need. You don't need to worry about uh, repenting of your sin, which means to turn away from it, not be involved in it anymore. Now, Pastor, we, we don't have to deal with that today. Oh, yes, we do. I mean, after all, Jesus came and he put an end to all these problems. No, he came and fulfilled the law. The covenant of God never changes. The covenant of God uh, does not uh, in any way detract from the past covenant of God. It's based on the condition that you keep your part of the bargain. And so it's very, very simple. He says, I've allowed you to see all these things and brought you through all these experiences and demonstrated myself and my ability to keep my word to you all through these 40 years. Well, how do you know it's 40 years? Well, because it says so. Remember? Moses said to the people, for 40 years I've led you. He was still there, wasn't he? And so, they're getting ready to go in, but... Moses, you remember, never goes in. And that's another story we'll talk about another time. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that even under the Old Testament law, the covenants of God demanded respect and response. And they demanded that we live a different life than those who are Worshipping and serving and depending upon the other gods. Now I said a minute ago, you need to be careful about who says, well, I'm a believer. And I know I spoke to this several times in the past. But today, there are many people in uh, the sports world, for instance. Now, Pastor, you're not supposed to judge. No, I'm, I'm not judging. I'm pointing out. There are those in the sports, sports world who many of them have been literally born again into the kingdom of God. I have no doubt that they are devout and serious, blood-washed, cleansed men of God, women of God, and they serve Almighty God through the Lord Jesus Christ, their Redeemer and mine, yours. But what I'm saying how many times do we see somebody uh, when the, they hit a home run or when they just escape being out on the base paths or when they score a touchdown or when they stop another team from being able to progress and, and make a touchdown? Uh, what do they do? Oh, well now... Which God are they saying that to? The reason I say what I'm saying is because those in the sports world who have genuinely been born again live a different lifestyle. They don't live like they lived before they met the Lord, before they were converted. And you and I need to know that all of this pointing heavenward, I'm a believer, I'm a believer, they may be a believer, but what God are they believing in? You never hear them say much about the Lord Jesus Christ. They're always talking about God. Well, which God? What God? There's lots of gods. There's a God of power and might. There's a God of uh, financial abundance. There's a God of political authority and power and influence. Uh, there's all kinds of gods in this world that are not Almighty God or the Lord Jesus Christ in any measure or thought whatsoever. And so what I'm saying is 
we can learn from this lesson and from this covenant that God is making with Israel, the second one in the wilderness. And we go on. He says, I'm, I'm showing you these things and reminding you of these things, lest there be somebody uh, in your midst, of your family, your tribe, your circle of friends, that claims to be what you are, but they really are planting the seed of poison that brings division, rebellion, ridicule, criticism, all kinds of sin of the flesh, immorality. You know, to me, I think we have to have a clear-cut line of embarkation. On this side of the line, there are areas that we do not cross. Now, I'm well aware that uh, the Bible says that if we were to completely remove ourselves from the presence of sinners, we'd have to leave this world. Well, praise God, it won't be long, I'm sure, until this old body will leave this world. Not the body, but the spirit within it. But, <clears throat> what I'm getting at is that there has to be a testimony of responsive righteousness, a walk in faith, a declaration of the entire and only power of the Word and the, and the power of Almighty God which resides in Jesus Christ our Lord and Redeemer. What he's talking about is that spiritual walk of truth and faith and uprightness before God versus uh, uh, the way that the world lives in their carnal flesh and their ungodly immoralities and abominations. And so he's saying if you have even one person that you allow to sow this seed to plant this root, it will spread and it will affect the whole congregation, the whole group. And tragically, uh, down through the last uh, century or two, we've not had men who had the courage to say unto those who are sowing the seed of dissension and rebellion and uh, uh, immorality and all of that within the body of Christ, uh, we need to understand that we must, as a people, demand a different standard for the believer than we do for those who are not believers. And there needs to be a line of demarcation wherein we say, this one is living according to the covenant of God and by the faith of God and through the Spirit of God. And this one is professing to be a Christian. They're professing to be a preacher or a pastor. They're professing to be a teacher. They're professing to be a council member or a board member. And they are not living for God, don't intend to live for God. And they're determined to defile that which is pure and those who are living for God and cause them to compromise their life and begin to mingle back in the world of sin and degradation that God calls abominations in his face. The covenant that God has given them here in the land of Moab, getting ready to go into the land that he promised, but he's making a covenant, but he's also with the covenant presenting a curse. And here's what we need to understand in the 19th verse. And it shall be when he hears the words of this curse. See, God's covenant is always a covenant of blessing, ability, power, provision, covering, protection, deliverance, whatever uh, the saints of God need comes from God Almighty. That's the covenant that he's giving, but with the covenant there's a curse. And the curse is that those who refuse to abide knowing my word, knowing what I have done for them, having been 
in the position of seeing the proving of my ability and word and authority, and now are willing to compromise that and go back into the ways of the world, are living under a curse. So a covenant is both blessing and curse. Blessing to the righteous, curse to the unrighteous, especially those who know the truth but refuse to walk therein. And uh, Moses describes it as the Lord is speaking through him, and it says, uh, It shall be when he hears the words of this curse, that he will boast, saying, I have peace through, though I walk in the stubbornness of my, of my heart. What's he saying? Hey, I've got peace because I, I've accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord. But have you accepted his word as a way of life? I've accepted the fact that he died on the cross. But have you accepted the fact that the purpose of that was to change your life. Replacing it with life, which is spinning the ages of eternity in perfection, a perfect place, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, blessing and cursing. I want to walk in the blessing of the Lord. I know you do too. And so beware of those who say, Oh, it's not important to keep the Word of God. It's not important to really be that concise about the way you live. I'm talking about the inner workings, the inner fellowship or lack thereof. I'm talking about the relationship that you have with Almighty God. I'm talking about being delivered from the bondage of the law that uh, always cause sin to bring forth its deadly work of death and damnation. And so you see, beloved, if you know that there are those who claim to be of God, claim to be born again, and they're able to walk before you or to speak in your midst or to live a lifestyle in your midst and say, ah, you guys can live that righteous life if you want to, but I've got freedom. I'm free in the Lord. I'm free to do what I want to do. But well, I want to tell you something. Uh, the I want to do is always a curse because it is the infectious root that presses away righteousness and opens the door for ungodliness and unrighteousness. So I challenge you, beloved, don't fall into the trap that that one says, well, I don't have to change my life. I'm at peace with the Lord. I don't have to worry about anything. I'm not concerned. Well, no, they're not concerned because their purpose is to destroy the watered land with the dry. Think about that. And so with that, we're going to stop. And uh, next week, we're going to deal with... Um, uh, verse number 20 through 29, and we'll conclude this study on the covenant that God made with Israel at Moab. Now, as we go into communion, let's turn to uh, the book of Luke, and we're going to go to chapter 22, and I'll begin reading with verse 14. We want to remember that um, uh, Jesus now has come upon the scene after the disciples have gone in advance and uh, prepared a room for them to have the Passover supper, and... Uh, so verse 14 picks up the thought, uh, when the hour was come, it says, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. 
Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And as I have mentioned many times as we use this scripture, this speaks of the excitement, of the longing, of the desire of the Lord Jesus Christ to finally bring to a conclusion his ministry here on this earth, having done what he needed to do to prepare uh, himself and those who would follow him uh, with the word of God from Almighty God the Father. And now he has come to that point where he recognizes and, and knows that it's time for him to be offered up as a sacrificial offering once and for all. He now is saying to his disciples, in, in so many words I suppose it would be like you and I if we were uh, in charge of a, a group of men and came together for a final gathering before uh, a great climactic event. Uh, uh, we would thank them for being there, for being faithful, etc. We don't know all of the uh, bystanding conversations that might have went on, but we do know that when they came to order and sat down, that Jesus said, I'm glad we're here. I'm glad that uh, we have this opportunity. I've looked forward to this time when I could really complete the work that I came to do. And so, as we take of this supper, there are things that you need to know. And so with that, he opened up and, and he begins to give the instruction about taking of the bread and drinking of the juice of the vine. And with that, I want to say, if there be anything in our lives that it not ought to be there, we need to get rid of it. We need to turn away from it. We need to ask cleansing for it because we find instructions in the Word of God in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that if we do not properly respect, if we do not honor in reverence that which we're taking part of, that we're actually uh, really inviting a curse to come upon us of, of uh, death and infirmity, and it could very easily happen. And so we talked about that last week when we had communion. This week, I'm just going to offer a prayer and ask God to prepare our hearts and cleanse us from anything, and you pray your prayer along with me, and we'll believe God as we take of communion together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the privilege of sitting together, eating together the communion bread and the, and the juice of the vine, Lord, that you have told us that we should take in remembrance of uh, what you did for us at the whipping post and the cross. And so, Father, I ask you now, to let your Holy Spirit convict us if there be anything in our life that not ought to be there. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us and to cleanse us. And we reject and turn away from those things that are uh, impure and unclean that might be in our lives. And Lord, we turn away from them in the name of Jesus. Your name, Lord. And we claim the righteousness of your righteousness as we take of the bread and the fruit of the vine, and we declare it in your name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now let us take of the bread. And as we hold it now, we've already broken the bread here, and I'm sure you probably have uh, broken yours as well. But the broken bread represents the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've had people say, well, now you know, Pastor, that's really not true. There wasn't a bone in his body broken. No, I'm not talking about the bones. I'm talking about the flesh that was torn from his back and, uh, and the punctures in his forehead and in his hands at the cross and all of that. And his flesh was ripped from his back as he was tied to the whipping post. And so as we eat of this bread, we're reminded that that was a part of the sacrificial offering that he made that you and I might come to the Father and say, Father, He paid for our healing. He paid for our deliverance. He paid for our needs. And we claim that. And we claim it now in His name. And so with that, let us eat together with true reverence and respect for what Jesus did in His terrible suffering at the whipping post for you and for me. Let us eat together.
Now as we take the cup, we're reminded that it represents the blood that flowed from his body. And as I look at him and I think about it, I think I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. But Lord, you didn't ask me to be worthy. You said you would be worthy for me. And so I love you, Lord. And as we take this representation of the blood that you shed in our behalf, we give you praise and glory and thanks for what you did, that we might exchange the law of death and sin for the law of life and eternal righteousness, purity and holiness in the kingdom of God. And we thank you for that, Jesus. In your name we declare it. Let us drink together. You have been listening to Christian Living 101 with Pastor Gene Applegate. This study is presented without church or organizational bias. We are totally supported by your prayers and generosity. Your comments and questions are welcome. Email us at gene at christianliving101.org or write to Christian Living 101. P.O. Box 72150, Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. That's gene at christianliving101.org or write us at Christian Living 101, P.O. Box 72150, Phoenix, Arizona, 85050.